what is up everybody and welcome to yet another episode of the camera junkie live streams my name's lewis also known as mr camera junkie where i remind you to upgrade your skills before your gear if it's your first time here welcome please be sure to introduce yourself and say hello in the chat so that you can get the nice camera junkie crew welcome and as tradition goes around here first thing we do is check to see exactly who's in chat to see who's hanging out with us tonight and right off the bat we have paul mr moderator saying hello to the fam also saying hi to parker jennings as parker is saying hello to everyone the, wow it looks good hold on let me there we go center that it's looking good He's joking around saying, hey, Paul, long, long time no see. <laughs> Lot time no see. <laughs> There's Paul smiling. All right. And with that, today we're going to be talking about a Nikon rumor. So last week we spoke about Sony's new releases that are to be announced on Tuesday. I have to check the calendar back there on Tuesday, the 29th. It looks like 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be getting the release of the Sony. A right. Is it? Yeah. The Sony a seven C Mark two and the Sony a seven C R for resolution. So we should be expecting those to be announced on the 29th we got marine x in the house saying what up big dog how you doing bro thanks for taking the time and stopping in um but yes but even though that we are talking and i majorly shoot sony cameras right but at the same time i'm also a camera junkie and i'm a fan of all cameras including that one right up there on the top shelf that's my last nikon or nikon 5100 and that one is still a great camera um it has my all-time favorite nikon aps-c lens which is the 35 millimeter f 1.8 that thing just takes magical shots and with the nikon color science right but mostly their their codec and the way that you can manipulate the files in post is what's like so good about the Nikon system, at least for me. And uh, that combination is just dope. But I might, and I say might, be looking into a new Nikon camera if this bad boy that I'm going to talk about today lives up to what it is expected to be. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about Nikon's new upcoming camera, the Nikon ZF. Now, are you saying, hey, Nikon already came out with that camera? Kind of. They came out with the ZF-C. And C, I guess, standing for crop or, you know, APS-C, right? The, the actual aspect of that camera was the design and it's still being an APS-C camera. So now we're taking that same design language, the same design aspect and the features of the ZFC and bringing it to a full frame uh, sensor and now having that camera available being the ZF. And there's quite a few specs that we're going to go over in a little bit. And if you're saying what kind of you know style are you talking about well it's more of a traditional type of you know 35 millimeter film camera so the one that i'm pulling out right here is my fuji film and this is my fuji xt1 now fuji has been famous for keeping this old school camera design with the single lens uh, or viewfinder in the center. But more importantly than anything, as I go to my overhead camera, is what we're talking about are the dials on top. So the Fuji cameras are famous for having all of the settings in dials right on top, easily accessible. So if you want to change your aperture settings, 
your shutter speed or anything in between with the dials that live in the front right here and then also in the back you have full control over you know your iso your shutter speed your aperture everything at like the click of a dial and you do not have to go into the insides into the sub menus digitally at all whatsoever to change the majority of the settings that you would use with a camera in this style as you can see it's got like the traditional camera motif or better said silhouette right whenever you see like a camera logo anything of that sort it has this traditional style now sony wanted to keep this same type of body style or styling uh in their full frame cameras and they have done and fuji has been more than famous for keeping all of the dials and all of the settings physically on top which is the difference in sony between fuji and other cameras and nikon has never really been one to have all of the settings on top until they came out with the zfc and the zfc was to be a direct competitor of the fuji line type of cameras or you know like the budget leicas so if you were into this type uh, or into this style of camera for your photography then that was the kind of the demographic that nikon was shooting for when they came out with the zfc aps-c camera because it directly competed with the fuji line and fuji's cameras majority most of them being aps-c now that fuji has also dabbled into full frame nikon hasn't is not sitting back and with the success of the zfc they have decided to take it upon themselves to actually release um a zf camera that is the full frame equivalent you know what i got a photo over here and let me see if i could just boop yeah all right so this is provided from sony alpha rumors which is exactly where i got it but as you can see here this is pretty much what you're looking at kind of like that replica of that old school type of camera and what we're going to be expecting as you can see from there it has a lot of the similar top dials and physical dials on it which is what you found in the zfc so it just looks like it is an exact mock-up of the zfc design but with a full frame sensor in it so now let me give you another photo of this we're talking here Oop, there we go. This is the back side of it. There we go. I'm going to go OCD on it. And then the last one that shows the flippy screen. And if you haven't done so already, make sure to hit the like button. It goes a long way and is highly appreciated. So these are the first shots that we have of this rumored camera that's going to be coming out soon. Now, this is the ZF. And what we have here is just basic layout, a standard articulating flip out screen, which is what is found on the newer um nikon cameras just like the zfc so there's really no difference but this is pretty much the general layout of what we could expect so this camera if i haven't given you the hit hint already um i still have this fuji and a lot of my sony cameras i also like this style of camera um sony is my go-to when it comes to production work because of the functionality and the final product that you get but i still hold on to this fuji for a lot of my own personal shots here with aiden and so on and so forth because i still like this style it's kind of like 
driving a manual car comparative to an automatic you you always use the automatic for your day-to-day -day, you know like grocery getting and running errands but every once in a while on the weekends you want to take out that manual you know hit the clutch shift some gears and have some fun and that's what i find with my fuji cameras and now this one is also intriguing me in that same type of um, department now it's supposed to have been announced this month of august but we haven't gotten any official announcement the release is supposed to be set back towards the end of the year so if anything like this were to happen it will probably be for like the winter time so to speak the holiday season if not maybe next year but still something that is in the back of my mind um it's a 24.4 megapixel backside illuminated sensor. And if you've been to some of my live streams previously where I mentioned, most people don't know that Sony is, you know, the corporation, the components making machine that they are, they provide the sensors to Nikon for their cameras and also to Fuji and quite a few other, you know, um, companies like Apple for all of their iPhone so if you say like i don't like sony i just use my iphone you're still shooting a sony mirrorless camera whether you think it or not so at the end of the day you're shooting sony right but now with this new form factor it's got a 24.4 megapixel backside illuminated sensor which is i think kind of the same one that you found on the a7 you know series that a7 line that been using that 24.4 bsi uh cmos sensor and it's a cmos sensor so it's not um stacked so it's still backside illuminated which will help with low light um captures and capability but it's not going to be like the fastest when it comes to everything else or, or better said like the the readout speed of it but we should hope that with other aspects of you know the the computation getting faster that the camera is just gonna hold up you know just fine which i don't doubt um it's it's said to have in-body image stabilization or ibis so that's good for for what i really would like to use it myself and i would assume a lot of people in this genre or this style of photography would want to do the same which is use manual lenses now i do have this fuji right here and it has that fuji auto lens but my favorite lens for fuji on this camera is this tiny little per gear let's see if i can get that in shot there this tiny little pancake lens a per gear this is a 35 millimeter um APS-C 1.6 super super small um but the the quality of glass that's in it and and the quality images the quality of images that I get from this are just I I stay blown away every single time that I use it but it is full on manual focus, right? So it's like taking this experience of being like manual transmission and slowing it down even slower into like school zone. So you're in a school zone in a manual car when you're using a manual lens because it's taking that photography thing and slowing it down even more before you press the shutter. But I continue. Um, this new camera is going to have a shutter speed from one to 8,000. And I do believe the 8,000 from 4,000 to 8,000 will be like solely electronic shutter because this is going to have both a manual and electronic shutter. Um, continuous shooting is rumored to say up to 30 frames per second. If that's correct, and my assumptions of the sensor are correct, and that's going to be 30 frames per second in JPEG only, right? Off of this sensor, um, I would like to see what types of, you know, frames per second you'll actually get in continuous shooting with, you know, the actual manual shutter. And, you know, like, yeah, the manual shutter is going to be the, the basic, the biggest hindrance like how many frames excuse me i'll probably say like 12 to 15 most likely is what 
I would expect this camera to have, especially with it being so compact and having in-body image stabilization into this small frame factor is going to be very interesting. Um, it's going to have 4K60 for video, so that's that's really good. Um, so anything under that type of codec or demand should be piece of cake. So 4K30 and all these other things should be a breeze to be used on this camera. And it also is going to have USB-C connectivity with PD, which is power delivery compatible. I'm not sure exactly if Nikon is coming out with a direct plug and play webcam feature as far as their software goes, but we'll see when that camera actually hits the shelves. And it's still got a ways to go when you really start talking that it's going to be the end of the year when it actually starts shipping out um it says and this one this one is like this one i have to like kind of give props so let me just no that's not it this is it yeah, so give an applause to Nikon for this because I had mentioned this to be implemented in a camera a long time ago as a request for a Sony camera, but it looks like Nikon listened to me and they're implementing a dual card or dual memory card slot on this new ZF camera. And why am I making such a big fuss for dual memory cards? Because we're talking about how compact these cameras are. And sometimes we just looking for redundancy. And I had mentioned that if you can't fit a full size, SD card on it to add a micro SD card on it because those memory cards still have very high capacities of a, a, a terabyte even you know on something this small as far as memory goes and we're using those high capacity high quality memory cards on drones all the time to get great footage so we should be able to implement a micro sd card slot as the secondary memory card for a photography camera and nikon listened so they actually have a the, the dual memory card slot sd plus a micro sd so for that once again <laughs> nikon give you big ups for thinking outside of the box right and adding something that people are really going to utilize in the smallest form factor possible so i gotta give it up to them for that um it's also gonna have pixel shift so if you're not familiar with what pixel shift is it's basically using the ibis or the image uh in body image stabilization of the sensor and as that moves around within the camera body itself if you place a camera with sensor shift or pixel shift technology applied into it, you're able to place that camera onto a tripod and take a high or extremely high resolution, high megapixel reading of camera with extra like um, extra dynamic range and extra color information because of the way that the sensor works and how you're able to take the image. So it's pretty interesting the way that it works. So um, I'm going to demonstrate it with this, the, the frame of what you're looking at right now. So let me shut these uh, photos off real quick. What am I going to use as a reference? Okay, I'll use a napkin. All right, so Chipotle to the rescue. All right, let's say this is the size of your sensor, right? But the image that you're trying to capture is this big, right? Is the size of this screen. Now you could probably fit this sensor within this screen four times, right? If you were to put it like this. So that's pretty much what the camera is going to do for you. You're going to set the camera on the tripod and the sensor is going to basically shift, take a photo, 
then shift up, take a photo, shift, take a photo, shift, take a photo, and then take all of that information as it shifted and render it as one image with extra high fidelity and extra color information. And the reason why we're talking about extra color information and just to get a little nerdy on you is the fact that there are light receptors on the sensors of these cameras and some of them are dedicated only for the red channel of light. Some of them are only dedicated to blue and to green and they can't live in the same exact spot, right? It's impossible. So when the light is traveling and hitting the sensor itself, it's going to pick up the red in only the red channel, the green in only the green channel and the blue in exactly only that channel. But with the pixel shift, once you shift them over and you're actually taking multiple images, you're now shifting those uh, light receptors, right? And the ones that are dedicated to the color. And now where the green was, the red is, and where the green uh, was before the, the blue, it's where the blue is and vice versa. And they all shift in their color receptors locations and are able to grab the red the blue and the green from every single location as if every single pixel or photo site that's receiving that information actually has all three at the same location so it's super cool technology getting like super nerdy but that's pixel shift kind of like in a nutshell and that's why you're able to get super high resolution with like uh, crazy amounts of dynamic range and all of this built right in so pixel shift as you know these cameras keep getting better and better and faster and faster that technology that was not the best when it was first introduced is now getting to the point where it's becoming very very viable for taking like high resolution pictures of landscapes and a variety of different things that i would say are more static you know, because you wouldn't really be able to use pixel shift in high moving scenarios with action shots just to, you know, give reference. So that's pixel shift in a nutshell. Let's continue. It supposedly has improved autofocus over the Z5 and the Z6 II, which could or could not be the best thing. But we all know that we're with all of these newer cameras the autofocus is doing pretty good on all of them even the one company that was like lagging behind which was panasonic uh now has even uh phase detect autofocus so they're doing very well just the same way all right we continue Yes, it said that it was supposed to be announced right now, but I had already mentioned the launch is going to be the end of 2023, the end of this year. So we should be expecting the announcement officially to come out, hopefully within the next uh, 30 days or the next calendar month. The going price for this camera is $2,000 or $19,999, right? And that's not the most egregious price for everything that I've been mentioning here, especially in a small, compact, you know, old school type of, um, you know, SLR type battery camera type battery. Listen to me. No type body SLR type body camera. That would be, you know, this um, ZF. Um, let me see what else I would think is important. And no, I was just saying that it has a variable angle, like LCD monitor, um, a small grip, right? And that it, yeah, I, I think that's pretty much everything. Oh, no, no. This is what I wanted to talk about, which is why I kept reading. I was like, I know there was something else, right? They're saying the design layout and everything is very similar to the ZFC, which is what I had mentioned. But more importantly, that there's the ability that this might be coming with a 40 millimeter F2 kit lens. Now, 40 millimeter in full frame um, is a very popular street photography focal length. And the F2 making it very good in low light, you know, shallow depth of field and 
that's going to be very interesting because if that kit, this ZF 40 millimeter F2 lens comes with it for the, you know, $2,000 price. Now, I think that's going to be a steal of a deal, especially for everything that you're getting. Now, if it's $2,000 body only, then we'll have to see exactly because then I have to finagle and see exactly what lenses are available or what I can do. And oh, Randy's here. I was just going to go into the chat right now and I see that Randy's here but that reminds me that I spoke to Randy a while back and he told me that there is a full autofocus adapter for the Z cameras to utilize Sony lenses now if you can put it in chat Randy I would appreciate it to confirm that that I believe there's an adapter that gives you full autofocus um, with sony lenses on your z cameras and if that's true then this might be a possibility like i said because of the simple fact that my favorite lens of all time is the zeiss 55 millimeter for the sony you know uh e-mount and if i can use that lens or all of my other sony lenses with this camera then I think it, it's going to be on like Donkey Kong. You know what I'm saying? Just because I think this is a really cool piece and I would like to see, maybe I'll rent it. You understand? But if it lives up to the hype, this might be something that I, I'll be pulling the trigger on as a camera junkie. This might be my next Nikon camera because I really like the ZFC. But there was no reason for me to get it with the amount of APS-C Sony cameras that I already own. So let me know your thoughts about this camera. If this is something that you're interested in yourself. This is something that you're like, nope, I'm never going to get into Nikon. But as a camera junkie, I just wanted to share this with you to let you know that, you know what? There's a variety of different cameras and it really depends on what you like. And if you're someone who likes to do you know manual photography in one way or another then this might be a camera that you might be interested in so i wanted to let you know and now let's check to see exactly what's going on in the chat yes paul says don't forget to hit the like button it's highly appreciated guys thank you very much and he's also saying check out the new mr camera junkie merch yes Actually, you know what? Let's check that link and make sure that I fixed it. Because if not, I'm going to fix it right on the spot. If that's sending you, you know what? Let me let me check myself. I am checking to see if this is sending us to the right place. And it is. Okay, good thing I changed it. All right, because I kind of forget which ones I have and haven't done yet. But this is opening up my fourth wall, which is where you can find pretty much everything, including the latest videos of my channel or in the banner right up top. You can find all of my merch there. So thank you again, Paul, for being better than me <laughs> all right and uh yeah like this shirt this is one of my new designs this is just like a topographical you know like uh lines but it's still the upgrade your skills logo and like i said i've been super happy with the quality of this merch you, like you can see the details let's see if we can catch that in 4k what's up Look at the detail of the sleeve, how you can see like all the little lines. Oh, it's catching my face. Sony's too good for for autofocus. Actually, you know what? Let's let's try this. All right, let's see. Chipotle sensor. Oh, I like that. 
as you can see all the extra details within the design itself is why i'm so ecstatic about moving all my merch to fourth wall i can honestly tell you that i don't even have to worry anymore about like the quality control like i could feel like rest assured that you know people are going to get what they expect or what i expect out of it so it's really giving me the green light to give the go ahead like check that out and thanks once again for paul for putting that out there says uh randy saying hello everyone nikon is holding off to announce this product until early september and after sony's a7 II and a7c late august announcements oh that makes sense yeah because I wouldn't expect it to be before the 29th and yeah, cause they will lose all momentum. So if they want to steal some of that away from Sony, it makes sense to announce it shortly after, or maybe the next month. Randy also says, I have a lot of those micro SD cards from 256 gigs to one terabyte, slow in transferring files, but great for storage and 4K recording video. Exactly. And we're talking about redundancy because whether we're recording it on a GoPro, a 360 camera like the one that I have, whether it's on your actual camera, once it's recorded, we're good just as long as we have that file but you know, it might take just as long to get it off out of any of these devices, but that's the name of the game. If you want to have one terabyte of backup, then it's going to take longer to have that. But I guarantee you that if somebody were to have forgotten a memory card, or if you know, you want to use it more of a professional basis, the way that I even had mentioned it was like, don't record to it initially, right? So let's say, for instance, the ZF camera is going to have an issue overheating because it's trying to transfer 4K60 video, 4K60 video to two memory card slots at the same time, right? When the bigger one, the regular SD is going to have the higher like bandwidth and easier to transfer 4K60 footage without overheating that fast, right? So what would I do? I would set the system to record directly to the main SD card, right? And that high bit rate. And once the file is done or it creates or to a certain buffer, then it starts recording it slowly to the secondary micro SD card. And like, once you, I guess, you know, like you're done, it will then make a carbon copy of it onto that micro SD, knowing that it's going to take longer time. Right. So that it just also doesn't drain your battery all in one shot. And that's just me thinking. Right. If they implement something like that, then that's going to be a dope, dope, dope redundancy backup system right within your camera, which is probably going to sell that camera a lot more for people who do need two card slots. Oh, slides in the house saying hi, but just uh, driving, but just wanted to say hi. Sammy superstars in the house saying hello to everyone. Randy saying, so deciding between the Nikon ZF and the Sony A7C2 for buying. It depends of not having no video recording time limit and overheating issues. Megadap ETZ 11, which is, or 21 adapter, which is fantastic. Okay. So you see, he confirmed it. Thanks, Randy, to let us know that, yes, you can mega adapt sony lenses to your nikon z mount cameras so that's like super dope paul thanks again bro you're awesome <laughs> i just had to laugh at gretchen hashtag never never nikon <laughs> it works the link thank you very much Thank you. Thank you. James hatches in the house, the belief hero saying hello. Uh, Kevin Cox is also here saying hello to everyone. L just, just in time, not late, just in time. And Randy saying Sigma now has their Trinity APS-C glass for Nikon as well. The 16, the 30 and the 56 F 1.4. 
I it, it 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 shouldn't have taken that long because all they literally do is change the back <laughs> of the lenses. So I guess it's more permission than than know how. But as soon as they do that, it's kind of funny. Like you could take the majority of these uh um the Sigma lenses, the Sigma Trio, and unscrew the four screws from the back and change them out to like micro four thirds. Put them on there and boom, you're pretty much good to go. Randy says, Apple cell phones uh, have storage built in and you don't have to buy SD cards. They're already installed. Yeah, but then that also has to do with the difference because when we're talking about external SD cards, they're always going to be limited by the amount of or like the, the bandwidth that you can transfer through these connections. So let me just pull out an SD card here. Right. Whether it's a full size, like I'm about to show you, or a micro SD, we're limited to those connections right there. And all your data has to travel through that. When you are talking about soldered on memory, even though it's 256, 512, a terabyte, et cetera, et cetera, it's a different type of memory and that it has a lot more contact points like a lot more like if you would say the chip is half this size but then you'll probably have like i would say 50 maybe 60 solder points that will get melted down between the memory module itself and the board which reduces the latency which helps increase the data transfer and that will actually help you know the computing device in its totality the the iphone or whatever it is to actually be able to transfer the files that much faster creating less heat because it has less to do it's like you won't break a sweat when you're working half as long all the time i can get nerdy with this sometimes sorry guys all right. Kevin says, what if the first file fails for some reason before it gets copied to slot two? Ooh, that's a good point, Kevin, because that is usually like the reason why you would get the two card slots and why you have the redundancy. So I agree with you when I had first mentioned it as the redundant micro SD, right? I thought of it as that, you know, like current built in backup system. But if it's recording to both of them at the same time, the heat that the camera is going to create or the chances it chances of it overheating are going to increase tremendously. Right. And then if we're talking 30 frames per second, you know, of burst speed, like it's rumored to come out. That would have to be one heck of a little machine, man. That's all I'm going to say. Because more than anything, it has to do with heat dissipation. And this is not going to be carrying a fan as we saw before. So I don't see where that would. I would say that you'd be limited to the speeds of the memory, the micro SD card, which. How can I say, like, I I totally agree with what you said, but at the same time, to actually utilize this correctly, I would still think that it would have to be like a redundant system. If it's unfortunate, right? Like, I wouldn't be surprised, but if it's unfortunate for whatever reason, you lost the original file, it's like you never had it in the first place. So... We'll see, man. That's such a good point. And now I'm really like hyper interested to see exactly how that's going to work with the micro SD. James says, I went with the S 5 X and it's been cool. I'm glad I know. And that's a great camera. I was just mentioning that even Panasonic's got their, you know, their autofocus game on top shape. So nothing, nothing is pretty much bad these days. And that's what I was saying. That it's like, it's got improved the autofocus. The autofocus isn't bad when Nikon's cameras in the first place.
Gretchen says, soon to be a t-shirt on my fourth wall. So are you going to create one? I can't wait to see it. Or is it something that I said? Oh, the the hashtag. Never, never, never Nikon. <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that, Gretchen. <laughs> Throw some shade. Trust me, you'll get a lot of people to bite. Okay, so Randy says, I agree on your point. The more extra contact points make the V90s faster speed. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it does. Uh, maybe the internal micro SD is soldered chip instead of the SD card. We won't know because it's a rumor. Actually, you know what? You know, as I was reading that, my mind was still just grinding away. And then I was thinking, you know what? I'm talking as if these cameras are not working off of a buffer system. Right? These cameras have a buffer. So all of the images, right? All of the images are getting stored to the buffer first. So unless the, you know, the, that the file, like the, not the file, the memory card actually goes defective in the middle of you using it. There shouldn't be any reason why the file would be corrupt. But at the same time, if it is in the buffer and they give the buffer enough room, enough, you know, space, then it shouldn't have a problem to just keep it within the buffer parameter until it records it to both of them at the same time. Even if it takes it longer, if that makes sense. Right. So we're talking like on the millisecond scale. Right. You're, you, you know, you're seeing that the light goes on for like half a second and then, you know, it's recorded. So maybe the SD card is going to take the micro SD card to correct myself is going to take a full second. Right. So you'll just see it recording and it will record to the micro, uh, to the regular SD and then to the micro SDs like at the same time, but still it's just going to take longer. So. The entire process isn't done until it's recorded to both, which, yeah, kind of brain farted on that. So that would just make absolute sense to do it that way and just increase the buffer size on the camera so that it has enough capacity to push the file, you know, to both um, memory cards before it releases it from its memory. All right. Gretchen says, yes, I will. So I can't wait to see that shirt. James says, my autofocus sometimes gets wonky, but I'm still a little bit overwhelmed by it. If you're not doing anything, and, and this is just tip, right? If you're not doing anything like this, you're like, hey, you know what? Check this out because I want you to look at this thing, right? then you might be good with manual focus. So for example, let's go to this shot right here. This is my Sony a seven R two. Now the a seven R two, I decided to go vintage baby. I was like, you know what? I have all these lenses, but I also have all these vintage lenses. And just like I was saying that this little per gear lens is, you know, one of my favorites for my Fuji because it's fully manual and it just gives me the full like aesthetic, you know, experience this one I've set up the same way. So instead of having like my autofocus lens on there, I actually converted it because it happened a couple of weeks ago, right? It, we were talking about what was the, the adapter that I had that converted my Canon lenses to Sony and I couldn't remember the name and Kevin was trying to like give me like and it was like Viltrox and all this and I was like no it's not Viltrox and I couldn't remember it but now that I pulled it out it's Metabones and it's I have the Metabones adapter for my Sony a7 R2 and that's what you're looking at right now but you see the difference is like I can put my hand all in front of this and I've set the the lens to manual because I know that I'm going to be standing at this spot whenever I utilize this, this angle. 
And at the same time, I don't need it to try to hunt and focus. And the reason why I put it to manual is because the lens that I'm using is my Quantray 19 millimeter to 35 F 3.5 to 4.5 wide angle full frame lens. And that lens, although great, is a photography lens. So there's no such thing as silent autofocus with that bad boy right there. And if it, if I were to just do this and that, like, I would be afraid that like this microphone would even pick it up, even with all my noise cancellation and everything because of how loud it is. So I just clicked it over to manual, set it to the spot. And then when I sit here, you know, like I just came to, to, you know, before the live stream, I was like, look, that's out of focus. That's out of focus. And that's in focus and just set it and forget it. Right. Like the guy with the rotisserie chickens. So you just set it and forget it. And now we're set to go. And if you don't need it, then that might be like the best thing for anyone still trying to use their equipment while they're learning it. Right. That look switch back to this. And like I said, if you're not doing anything like that and you're just doing like talking head, you can kind of lock off your shot the same way. And there's also still a bunch of different options because if I decided to move that set over here, right. And have a static never moves, no autofocus so that it never loses me as you know, the person speaking, what I lose is the ability to like highlight an item like that. But if I were to lose this autofocus, like over here, I can simply just add another camera like so that will give me a top down view that will then just allow me to, you know, autofocus on this. And because there's no faces, you know, within this shot, then it's going to be a lot easier for it to focus and, you know, center its image power onto just the one thing that I'm talking about. So there's quite a few options and that's why I love doing all of this because you have the power to do that. You have the power to give like the behind the scenes look of what's going on here. Like my monster can and just everything this, I just love doing this week in and week out. So there's always options. Okay. So Randy says flash ROM like PCs for the buffer. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. But it's how much capacity is going to be built into these cameras, which is a spec that they really don't ever divulge to us. They just say the buffer holds this much, and but we really don't have an actual number because that, I'll tell you the truth, would be a much better figure for us photographers, videographers to actually deal with. Because if I if I'm correct, that same buffer that's used for the memory right to transfer is is that same ram memory that these uh cameras use as far as ram is random access memory so that's the same memory that's being used when you access your menu so the more buffer space or the more ram memory that you have in your camera the faster your menus should be able to move about the faster you should be able to like retrieve the the data from your memory card when you're trying to look over your images and the way that your camera overall performs has a lot to do with buffer and that's why i don't think they divulge that bit of information to us because they want us to keep thinking that megapixels is the only thing that matters when your buffer size and transfer rate have so much more to do with your overall camera performance. All right. <laughs> Kevin says for photo, you don't see it being too much of an issue. Video is where there might be issues. Exactly. And that's, that's, I agree with you. So if I wasn't clear on that, like that's exactly what I was thinking about when I was saying, man, you'd be limited to the speed of that micro SD card, right? It's like the saying, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So yeah, you're adding a second memory card slot, but if it's a much slower thing, it's an anchor at that point, right? Because you're dragging all the files waiting for that to, you know, clear up. So like, for instance, let's say you took a burst of 30 shots, right? It will hit the buffer 
and then it will be written to each one of the memory cards at its max speed right before it gets released so if it's 30 shots and you got a much faster you know full size sd card it might take let's say three full seconds of actual time to transfer 30 you know jpegs that you shot in one sequence in one button press right and supposedly that's every second so you hold down the the shutter button for two seconds you've taken 60 frames of photos now that's going to take three seconds to transfer to the sd card but maybe four or five seconds to completely transfer the same bundle of information to the slower micro sd now those times and features are completely off base they're completely out of whack just disclaimer that's just me trying to put an analogy of how i think the file system will go it says i had the settings that was perfect but i did something <laughs> you, well that's how you learn bro trust me because we all learn by by our mistakes right we all learn from the 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 hit that we hit ourselves and we're like oh i shouldn't have done that i should have done this spot yeah albert is in the house saying always love the way vintage lenses look yes and talking about vintage lenses i really really lucked out with that metabones adapter because on the time of its release was around the time of the sony camera that i have it attached to so the pairing of the metabones with the sony a7 r2 is kind of like a, a match made in heaven. Now I have this telephoto vintage lens. Okay. It's also a quanta ray, right? And it is my 135 millimeter to 400 millimeter zoom lens. Okay. And it is a photography only Canon APO lens. Uh, I've spoken about this before. I believe Gretchen, we were talking about it on a live stream. And the thing about that is that when that lens came out, Canon was doing digital autofocus, right? So the lens itself has contacts, but what wasn't really available when that lens came out was digital cameras. We still, we had digital contacts for autofocus, but we were still using film in the cameras themselves. So it was like the film was the antiquated aspect of it. And why that matters is because when you're shooting on film, the only thing get, that gets transferred to the film itself is light and light hitting the film gives you the image and the story. But what doesn't get transferred to that film is what focal length you were at, right? What was your aperture? What was your shutter speed? Like all of that digital information was not necessary because there was nowhere to put it. So all of these old school vintage lenses or designed for digital film cameras could not be transferred to their digital SLR cameras, right? Because of their, um, because of the simple fact that all that information that the DSLRs compared to the SLRs have are built into the camera. So now because we're shooting all that information into a memory card, now we have a place to put all that, what we call EXIF data, all of the stats of your files that works with your Lightroom, so on and so forth to give you all the specs and information of your shots never needed existence. So those contacts and everything do not exist on those older lenses, but here's the claim to fame, so to speak, or the, 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 the greatness of this meta bones, it replaces all that. It takes that information from the lens as it's being transmitted digitally. And now because you have this middle piece of the metal bones in place, 
it actually knows what the lens is doing and is able to transfer that data along with the file itself to the cameras because of it. So it saved my 135 to 400, you know, mega zoom vintage lens that whenever I shoot with that lens, people think I'm, I, it comes, it comes from a movie. Right? Like the images that I get from that lens and the background separation and the bokeh and everything off of that lens, people look or think that that's like was shot at a movie and that I'm taking like a snippet from a movie because of the look and the, and the feel that you get from that glass. I absolutely love it. And it's why this set, this combo, I'm never going to sell. I know I'm going to get other cameras and stuff like that, but this that combination, even if it's sole purpose is only so that I can continue using that lens. So be it just like I have my Nikon right there, my Nikon 5100, just so that I have the sole purpose to continue to use that 35 millimeter lens that I love so much. So be it. And the reason why I don't own a Canon right now is because of that <laughs> meta bones, because it literally takes all of my you know, um, Sony cameras and converts them to Canon, but this lens, this Quantum Ray 19 to 35, my 135 to 400 and my, my Canon 50 millimeter F 1.4 are like never get rid of lenses. Like those are just, it, it, it will be so hard to replace them. That is just like, yeah, uh, there's no way I, I just won't. They're old, they're clunky, they're heavy and they're awesome. And I love them for exactly that. Like even to the point that the autofocus works on that 135 to 400, but also at the same time, it doesn't because it is so, so slow, right? It's working as magic, but the, the motors inside and not, I'm not going to get technical with it, but you know, I've opened it up and I know that what's driving it is just so slow and so antiquated that it's just like, there's no point of doing it. I flip it to manual and just, but now it doesn't give any errors whenever I shoot with the lens, because if you were to try to use that lens on an action on an actual Canon camera that would take that mount, it would just give you error 99s all day, every day because of it. So that's my, that's my soapbox. All right. Albert says, uh, okay. He was saying about the vintage. Randy also says going vintage is cool. I wish I had windows XP to play my old PC games. Randy, you know about virtual machines, right? You, you you're, you're, you gotta know about it. So make sure if you can take any windows, machine actively right now and run a virtual machine a vm to run old school windows xp and you can play a lot of your old school pc games if you didn't know now you know nano's in the house saying hello folks how you doing bro thanks for stopping by kevin says that's what i had to do when i had the panasonic set up <laughs> The constant hunting for the uh for the focus drove you nuts. Absolutely. Yeah. But it works. Like that's the whole thing. It's only if like like to be honest, if you're dealing with more than one camera, you have the ability to put one on manual focus and like set it and forget it, which is what I've done. Right? We're talking about people who absolutely like let's say the makeup YouTubers, right? Who want to show something and they're like, hey, and they're doing the double hand thing so that they can show the product. They are relying on the autofocus and everything else just for the simple fact that they only have one camera. So it needs to do everything because it is everything to them. For me, on the other point, you know, I just make sure that the Sony has the eye autofocus and that, you know, links into me. And that's it. I just don't want hunting or like picking up the microphone and different things like that. That's my own, you know, personal pet peeves, so to speak. Christian says, yes, I dream about that lens. <laughs> Is that a lens like Canon? 
Now, I talked about uh, quite a few, so I don't know which one we're talking about, this one or that one. But my Quanta Rays, for those of you who don't know, Quanta Ray is actually a company who's basically now Tamron, right? They're one and the same. You know, uh, Quanta Ray, Tamron, basically Tamron is the new branded Quanta Ray from back in the day. That's why I had a shooting journal. I wrote the F stops. Exactly. You see, you brought it up and I didn't even want to go there. But now that you brought it up, let's talk about it. That Yeah, before when people used to shoot film to get better in photography was to know your specs, which is why I think or not. I think I know that today's digital photography, if you want to become a better photographer, go out there and sh take a shitload of crappy photos. Right. Because that's all you need to do. Like, just do that. And then when you go and you put them to Lightroom, you go, oh, my God, that photo was horrible. Horrible. What, what were the settings? That's when you go and you're like, oh, so if I'm shooting at a high shutter speed, right, with a high aperture and a low ISO, I'm going to get super unexposed shots that I, it, it's going to be blurry and like there's going to be nothing. And it's I can't even see anything off of this. This is a worse shot. And then you see another one that might have similar information, right? But then you say you're like, okay, the shutter speed was fast. And the aperture was like this, but oh, the ISO was like through the roof. And now it resolves something, but it's extra grainy. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere and we have somewhere to, you know, we, we have a foundation. And then you start saying, you're like, okay, so if I lower the shutter speed to allow the shutter to be open longer, it's going to allow more light to hit the sensor, meaning I don't have to have my ISO up in the clouds and I can bring that down. So it brings the noise down. And if I were to open my aperture, then that would let even more light in. And then that also amplifies, you know, how fast or how slow the shutter speed is. And I can take my ISO all the way to its native so that it has the least amount of grain or digital fuzz you know within the image and as you go and you start looking at that exif data you're able to learn and that's today in the digital age because it's so easy and all that information is in a column to the right whether you're using you know photo mechanic or you know like um whatever program that you're using to manage your photography lightroom etc but what gretchen was talking about was that before that, if you wanted to get that type of information so that you know what you were doing, you had to write down in a journal your camera settings off of something like this, right? You would set like your aperture, your shutter speed, and all the settings, right? And then on a manual lens over here, you would have your aperture, right? and the focal length and you would write down all of that stuff and then you would take a shot and you would note all of that and that would be your first image of that roll of film and if you changed anything and you would take the shot then you would jot down all that new information and all the differences on it and you put the number two on it and that would be your log for that roll of film so that then after you got it developed and you brought it back and you were able to see the images that you took because you took them in order you would be able to go back to your notes on what was shot with everything and look at your handwritten x of data so that you can see, oh, this one came out good with these settings. This one came out bad with those settings and learn the same way. You know how much that would cost in film that, you know, delayed my progress and so many people's progress as I could imagine. And once digital photography came into play, that's what allowed me to learn so much more for pennies on the dollar. You know, like literally pennies on the dollar. And I had said this before. I remember used to having a film photographer, like my film camera. And I could have a roll of film per year. 
because I wouldn't just snap away at everything. I would wait for special occasions and special photos for me to actually utilize them. So they were like time capsules of the year. And that's how I used to do photography. Melanie's in the house. It's been such a long time. We haven't seen you. Good to have you here saying happy Saturday. Well, happy to see you. Welcome. Says Randy says, I did a video and realized I turned off the volume for the camera, always making mistakes. Problem is when you get old, you keep forgetting past memories and wondering if you have deja vu. <laughs> That's funny, Randy. <laughs> I'll see when I get there. <laughs> it says those never replace lenses. Absolutely, man. Because the whole thing is you'd be upset if you get rid of it, right? And then you'd always be like, you know what? I'm going to buy it again. I'm going to get another one, right? And then that becomes the hunt. That becomes the biggest thing. And sometimes I feel like uh, it's just sitting there and I'm not using it. But then the day that I want to use it, even if it's to reference it, to show them like, oh, this 50 millimeter F1.4 from Canon, that go-to lens, like I would pick that over the F1.2. That's my own, you know, anyway. I sit on that soapbox as well. I'll stand on it, you know, I'll get off of it now. But I absolutely love that aspect. And those are the lenses that I would just hold on to. And like I said, my my um, Zeiss 55 millimeter that right now is like my favorite autofocus Sony lens. Love Zeiss glass. And I absolutely love all the videos and all the photos that I take with that lens. It's just, it has never disappointed. So, you know, come the future. And when I get a different setup, right? Let's say I change things up or in my next studio, right? Because the way that we're going to blow up, you know, we're going to be moving out of this small studio, which I love so much, but I can honestly tell you, we need to get bigger, right? And I can't wait for that to happen. So with that being said, once that happens, I might be able to set up a studio with longer focal lengths, right? And I know for a fact that I'll be using my Zeiss 55 millimeter, probably as my side shot over here, as my profile shot, if not my main shot, if the studio is long enough, but that's in the future because I don't even know what that studio is going to look like, you know? So timeless truth saying great show. Thank you very much. Thank you for hanging out, man. The star Wars tie fighter tonight. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but. Randy says, thanks, Louis. Deja vu moment. My mind is blowing up now. <laughs> Gretchen says, I have a great, um, I have my great aunt's camera from the 1930s. That's so cool. It has a metal stylus described shooting info onto the film itself. Oh, that is so cool. So it will probably write it like on the sides. Oh, that is so cool. Look at that. Like, you see how technology has come? Um, there's a window in the camera that opens and lets us right on the edge of each frame. That is so cool. And question, Gretchen, is that 35 millimeter? Like, just standard 35 millimeter, even from the 30s? That would be very interesting to know. Melanie says, I'm so grateful for how far technology has advanced. Yeah, that's what I was. I, I mentioned before that in 2020, you know, with all the lockdowns and everything like that, I took solace in taking a lot of photography for myself. And in that year, in that calendar year, I took over 50,000 shutter clicks. 50K. I could tell you that that was also an, an amazing like crash course, you know, and putting all of the things that you learned into practice and learning even more from it. And that's why I've always said from, you know, like the beginning of everything here on this channel is like I'm sharing to you my own personal experience. And one to take note because we're just past the hour is, you know, like people saying that 
full frame lenses uh, don't work better on APS-C cameras, so on and so forth. And I've always disagreed and I will continue, not because of anything that could be said about, you know, like other creators and their ideas are about the technology itself. It has to do with the final results, right? Final results at the end of the day is where I noticed the difference. So going back to kind of like my analogy, right? Of the, of the sensor, right? The Chipotle sensor. So let's say this is the APS-C lens and the size of my screen is the size of a full frame sensor, right? So this is just the crop that you would see within. So everything that you see as far as video is basically what you would lose on a APS-C camera, right? Follow along. Great. Now, with that being said, if this entire image here is what the lens itself is producing, and I'm literally just cutting out the center part that a hundred times out of a hundred times, the center is the sh sharpest part of any lens, right? You're always going to get distortion and the better or the more expensive or the higher priced, higher quality lenses is because they're giving you what's called edge to edge sharpness, right? Basically solidifying that if you're getting a wide angle, you know, like 20 millimeter that you're going to get that sharpness from edge to edge. Boom. Right? So if I put a good lens that has very good edge to edge sharpness and yet still the center of it is the sharpest area. And I put that onto my APS-C lens, knowing that I'm going to be using the crop factor multiplication. Then it's like me buying a pizza and saying my favorite part is the center. And I don't like the crust because the crust is your distortion of, of the edges. Right. And you cut out the center, right? That quality is going to be like just as good as like the rest of it, but you're removing the crust, <laughs> right? Like that's the way I see it. And the quality of the pizza itself, right? Or what's hitting the sensor all has to do with the lens that you put on it. So if you put a high quality lens, even if it's full frame onto an APS-C camera, then you are giving it the best chance for the best results. And that's what I've gotten from my own experiences. So it says deja vu is so true. Randy, um, it says my old fave said, no, it takes 620 film and has a fold out bellows. Okay. Then that makes a lot more sense, especially because of the size, giving you more room to actually like scribe onto the film. So to, to clarify, you know, the 620 film, you're talking about a big honker. So with that being said, like I was thinking, there's no way that we had the ability through the technology that was given to us, right. That was bestowed upon us that we don't have a way to transfer that EXIF data, even if it's through scribing onto 35 millimeter film, which is what we were talking about that particular lens. Melanie says 50 K. Wow. How do you keep track of that? Uh, barely, barely keep track of it. That's why I said it wasn't like, um, they weren't majority of them were personal images. So they're sitting here <laughs> in an external hard drive. And you know what? Let me give you a, a behind the scenes image here. I'm going to back out, but. have stacks right now if, if i could bring the microphone to me wow check this out so right now right here i have one two three four five six seven with this one eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen hard drives 
out in the open because I am consolidating all of my files. That's another step that I'm going to be taking fairly soon, which is Gretchen has been giving me her experiences with her external hard drive that she got from the sea. Right. She got like an external NAS or network stack attached storage. Um, I think she got 24 terabytes, but I'm going to be looking for something of that type of magnitude so that I can take all of the images, put them in there. Once they're all in one place, I'm then going to have to run some softwares to make sure that I eliminate the duplicates. And that's the cool thing that even though files could have different names when it comes to my photos, if I have them doubled up somewhere just because I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose the file, I don't want it to be taking up double the hard drive space. So they'll be able to read that EXIF data that's built into the files themselves that has nothing to do with the file name, but just the file. And if it sees that they are the same exact serial number and image, they'll just remove the you know, the additional one and just keep the original boom. So that's my next plan. But as you can see, they have that there. But like I said, I'm also glad that the majority of them were just me taking them with Aiden, right? Taking so many photos of Aiden. And I, I went through some the other day and it just brought a tear to my eye because he's come along such a long way. But then at the same time, there's still certain things that I'm like, He's still doing that. Like I, I, I had some pictures of him in his little baby crib and he's doing some things from back then that he's still doing that is like, you know, that's him. That's his personality. And it just like brought a tear to my eye because of how much I love my boy and that, you know, he's amazing to me, you know, to me, he's so amazing. And the fact that, you know, the little quirks of him being him are so him that I have photos of years ago where he's doing the same exact thing that he's still doing to today. And I found that to be like super cute, super amazing. And I just love my boy. I'm getting all teary eyed guys. So I love him, but I digress. Let's see what we're talking about here. Oh, we're okay. I'm stuck on something here. Okay, we're moving on. It says, remember that camera? My great uncle had one. Did I just lose my mouse? I think I lost my mouse. Okay, I'm turning it off. Turning it back on. Oh, crap. <laughs> I've lost control of Ecamm. Well, or better said, I've lost control of my computer because this mouse is no longer clicking any. Oh, my bad. My bad. Let's see. It should work now. Yeah, there we go. Says so I remember that camera. My great uncle had one. Okay, so he's talking about Gretchen's uh, camera. Let me explain. When I went to put the hard drive back, what I did was I put it on top of the trackpad that I also have connected to this computer. So it was pressing the click on the trackpad and I no longer had functionality on my, ca on my computer. I'm over here sitting like, why is the message stuck? Why can't I select anything? And that was just my bad. <laughs> James is laughing. Chipotle censor. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> you see, like that, that's, that's how, that's how t-shirts get made. Right. The Chipotle censor. <laughs> uh, it says the picture is great, but it tastes like salsa. <laughs> Gretchen says the camera is a Kodak number one, number one, a, okay. So let me read this correctly. The camera is the Kodak number one, a pocket camera. It's an amazing camera and it's still beautiful condition. Oh, that is so cool. And she also confirmed she's got a 28 terabyte. Let's see. 
Uh, so I have two 14 terabyte drives mirrored just for photos. So that's so cool. And if you guys haven't known about this, Gretchen is an amazing photographer, but you know, let's just leave it there because you never know. There might be some type of segment that might highlight someone like that. You know, I'm just saying. And if you haven't heard of that segment, that's what we're going to talk about now. It's just cities go channels that I think you should go and watch. But even though Gretchen is an amazing photographer, today's cities got is. Oh, let's not. Let's get. I lost my mouse. Okay, let's bring this up. And let's see if we got this done correctly. City of God channels that I think you should go and watch. And this week we're talking about Sly. Sly Reader is this week's channels that I think you should go and watch. And she had chimed in today in the chat saying that she's on the road, but that she's still listening in. So hopefully she's listening to me now. And uh, I just want to let everyone know that Sly has been consistent with weekly live streams that I'm a part of every Friday night. She's been taken upon herself and said that somehow I inspired her to help her do this, which makes it all that much sweeter for me because I absolutely love that she's taken it upon herself and creating her content. Now, her content is based around photography bags because it's exactly what she was talking about last night, what she talks about in a lot of her videos, and it seems to be her just natural passion. Uh, she's found other creators within YouTube that are doing the same thing that are also helping inspire her and keep her going in her, you know, like search for the perfect bag. And I am not the biggest bag person, but I actually enjoy her reviews because it's letting me know of a lot of newer camera bags that I personally am not familiar with. So if you haven't done so already, if you haven't checked her out just because she's been in chats of so many of these live streams, I will tell you this week's City's God is none other than Sly Readers. City's got channels that I think you should go and watch. And if you're into bags or want to support another one of the camera junkie creators, this is a channel that you should definitely go and watch. And yesterday she actually held a live stream. And she's also an OG member of the camera junkie crew. Right. And I did open up membership. So if you have, if you're interested in doing so and supporting me personally in my endeavors of photography, videography on YouTube, and just generally being the best father that I can to my son, Aiden, you know, for those people who want to see me win, you also have the ability to become a member. And she's one of the OGs. And she actually is one who just bought, uh, a camera junkie crew t-shirt so i'm just pressing play on yesterday where she can shows as she's surprised me with wearing camera junkie merch right here on her live stream upgrade your skills so thank you so very much for all of your support um i can't Thank you enough. You are an amazing creator and I can't wait to see all of your future videos from here on out. And everyone, this week's City's Gaw Sly Reader. If you haven't checked it out, this week's City's Gaw channels that I think you should go and watch. And that's it. And that's it for this week. Everyone, if you have any last questions or anything you want to share, do so now as I say goodbye. I hope that you learned something. This camera really has me intrigued, but I also learned so much from all of you, all of these amazing uh, creators that we have here in chat, everyone within the Camera Junkie crew. You guys are what make my weekly live stream the place to be, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So thank you all for being so freaking amazing. I thank you all, as always, for hanging out here with me and making this the best part of my week every Every week and if you haven't gotten the gist by now just let me let you know that we're going to be doing it all over again next week same time same place for episode 144 
Yes, you heard correct. 144 consecutive weeks without skipping a beat of the Camera Junkie live stream. And I can't wait to see all of your smiling faces as we do it all over again right here next week. So take care of yourselves and each other. And I can't wait to do it all over again next time. Talk to you.